Hello, everybody. Welcome to Spoiler Peace Theater, the podcast that doesn't give a shit about spoilers. We just want to talk about the movies. My name is Dave Riedel. My pronouns are he, him. I write for the Chicago Reader, and I'm a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association. My name is Evan Crean. My pronouns are he, him. I'm co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide to better living. And my name is Megan Kearns. My pronouns are she, her. I write film reviews for Edge Media Network. I, too, am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association, and I'm a member of Gallica, the Society of LGBTQ Entertainment Critics. Yes, you are. Oh, and salute. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot that part. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this week on the show, we're going to be talking about movies as we always do. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to mention that over on our Patreon, we are talking about William Friedkin's 1977 film Sorcerer. We decided to talk about Mr. Friedkin because he died last week, and uh, we are all fans of several of his films. Two of the three of us had not seen Sorcerer, so it's a lively conversation, uh, as all things with William Friedkin are. They're always lively. And so if you are a $5 patron or higher, that is available to you over on patreon.com slash spoiler piece. And while we're at it, I want to thank our sponsor piece patron, Heather Sachs. Thank you, Heather, so much for being our sponsor piece patron. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Heather. And this week on the show, we are talking about two movies both beginning with B, both playing with reality. It's it's a banner week. Oh, hey, the word banner begins with B. It's a banner week here at Spoiler <laughs> Piece. I feel like uh, we're watching Sesame Street or something. We're like, yeah. you know, the letter today is B, yeah. sponsored by the letter B. <laughs> so we are talking about uh, two films that I guess fall into the horror genre. Uh, we are talking about Brightwood, written and directed by Jane L. Carr, starring Dana Berger and Max Wartendyke. And we are talking about Bad Things, written and directed by Stuart Thorndark, starring Gail Rankin and Hari Neff. Uh, but first, we are going to talk about Brightwood, because that's just the order I pulled them up in on my on my tabs here in the old Google Chrome. So Brightwood, here it is. <laughs> this is a one-sentence IMDb summary, which is very short, but very uh, accurate. A couple finds themselves trapped while on a run around a pond. That is wow. true. <laughs> that is the most bare bones of summaries that I've heard them. Bare bones. I mean, it's true. It's it's they're trapped in a time loop, sort of, um, because I don't really know how you d- would describe it. Because different versions of themselves keep coming through and having different reactions to the same situation. Um, should mention that the uh, the couple in in this movie is on the verge of divorcing. I think when the movie opens up, um, the wife, whose name I think is Jen, is listening to a podcast about divorce. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> As her her husband is chasing after her uh, to go on this run and apologizing or kind of using it as a way to make an apology to her for getting really, really drunk and apparently hitting on one of her much older co-workers at a work function they had the night before to celebrate her big promotion, I might add. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we learn very quickly, uh, Jen is more or less fed up with this marriage and has been for the past five or six years as things have slowly gone from from manageable to bad to worse. And I don't know. She's just grossed out by him. Yeah, she just kind of thinks he's gross at this point. <laughs> his toenails, his smell, his snoring, his everything. rotting teeth. <laughs> Woo! Right, she says, I can smell your teeth rotting at some point. And it's like, oh boy. <laughs> she that's, eviscerates him. <laughs> that's a pretty, yeah, uh, pretty yikes. cruel. <laughs> yeah. Although <laughs> I was watching this and I was thinking to myself, I mean, I can't really speak to how his mouth smells because this is a movie, but everything else, I mean, the way she's describing it, he's not denying any of these things. <laughs> you know? yeah. That's true. He does seem that he's maybe a decent person at his core. He's just a complete fuck up. I, I don't really know how else to describe it. Um, he's, mm-hmm. uh, he's, he's a likable uh, actor, uh, which is good if you're going to be playing a character like this. And um, I have never seen um, Orange is the New Black, uh, but I do know that Dana Berger is in Orange is the New Black. 
Uh, this is the only thing I've seen seen her in, as far as I know. I think she's great. Um, but let's get back to the the thing. They're going on this run. She's basically trying to get away from him. <laughs> this pond is near their home. Clearly, they've she has run it many times before, and he knows it well enough to know the terrain. And all of a sudden, they realize that the 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 trail back out to the main part of their neighborhood they can't find it all they they keep coming back to this no swimming sign and this pond is kind of like my nightmare pond this is why i don't like lakes and ponds this thing is dank it's <laughs> fucking like the water's kind of brown it's just nasty yeah <laughs> and it's funny too because there's that no swimming sign and you know i think all of us probably watching the movie thought ew that's gross why would anyone want to swim there and then it becomes a joke later in the movie when he's like why is this sign even here who the hell he wants to go swimming in this grossness like <laughs> totally and um what starts to happen is they start to uh there's nobody else on the trail they run into what they think is just like a random homeless person, but then they realize it's not a homeless person, it's some weirdo. And then the husband realizes that it's probably, he's like, does that guy look like me? And she's like, yeah, it does look like you. And it turns out it's different versions of themselves that they keep running into who keep killing them or running away from them or whatevering them. And... um for about an hour and 15 minutes, uh, it basically becomes, it goes from being this domestic anger movie to being a sort of existential horror movie uh, that is by turns horrific and funny and dramatic and then horrific again and then dramatic. And in the end, I guess you would say horrific. <laughs> Although I don't know, does yeah. this does this movie have a point beyond you know like y- you'll cannibalize yourself in a bad marriage? I don't know. Um, what 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 did everybody think? I thought this was great. I yeah. really liked this a lot. I, you know, this is a very very small, very low budget, very very indie film. Dane Elkar did the writing, directing, the cinematography, the editing, some of the sound design. So, you know, this is a very, very, very much clearly a labor of love. And I think it shows. I think, you know, I've talked about this before. We've talked about this before about time loop films and they can feel very tedious very quickly because obviously you're seeing the same thing over and over and over. And of course, you're trying to capture that feeling or the filmmakers trying to capture that feeling for the characters. But as an audience, you can feel that that tedium and and it can negatively impact your viewing experience. But I think here it really does capture how Jen and Dan feel so trapped by not only their marriage, but their circumstances. And they just kind mm-hmm. of feel like they're spinning their wheels and there's really no good solution. And it is really funny that Jen, you know, was she's like, well, nobody asked you to come on this run when he like immediately he's complaining about how, you know, let's not go up that hill or let's not do that route. And she's like, no, 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 I'm doing it. I did not. Nobody asked you to come. I wanted to run by myself. And yet here she is trying to get away from him. And now she's trapped with him for all eternity. And, you know, I I think it's a very interesting movie. I think it it does its visual it's clever with its visuals and with its premise and i think that ending where (laughs) where you think she might be getting away because she's finally like fuck it i'm gonna swim in this no swimming gross pond and Mm -hmm. then surprise it's another one of her who kills her and yeah and then they're literally eating them and that's what they're doing is that there's a there's a version of them that is just killing all of them to eat and, you know, putting their bones up as like their skull and bones as like decorations. Yeah. Along with her uh, her eye, um, her earbuds. And I just I was like, wow, that is dark. That is a nasty, nasty ending. But it was mm-hmm. great. I really enjoyed this. I found this really fascinating. It reminded me a lot thematically in certain ways of um, the horror film uh, Coco D Coco Day, which is also a time loop film, also about a struggling marriage where in that one, they have a child that died. And so they're also dealing with grief. And that is a really gory, really intense 
ultimately beautiful film. But it, this kind of reminded me in that way where it's using a time loop to show, you know, emotional problems to show the problems of marriage. And I just I think it was really well done. I really enjoyed this. Lay it on me, Evan. I'm in the same boat. I really enjoyed this movie, Woo-hoo! too. I thought it was well done. I like the, you know, we've talked about this many times in the show. I like when you go sci-fi and you keep it like super narrow and you just focus on the human elements and the human impact. Um, One thing that I wanted to ask both of you, I was, so she made that joke about, oh, this could be some like alien time distortion. When she was looking at that weird glowing shiny thing, is that what we're to believe that this is some type of weird alien time warp that's been created that they're just stuck in and can never escape from? Maybe. Yeah, I was unclear about that too. And I thought, maybe. I also thought, oh, or is that a lure? So they can right. oh, yeah. So the yeah, other she does the yeah, other she... them can lure them and kill her. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because presumably they keep they keep narrating whatever version we end up with at whatever particular point of time, they keep narrating or saying, All right, that version of us doesn't know that we did this. Wait, I haven't seen that right. before. So on some level, I think that the Jen and Dan doing all of the killing and cannibalizing remembers that conversation about the alien orb. And it either is an alien orb and the filmmakers are like, hey, this will be a neat gag. Or it's Mm -hmm. like you uh, said, a ruse, you know, Uh, Mm -hmm. either way, it gets the job done. (laughs) Agreed. But great question, Evan. Great question. I was definitely wondering that, but I, I, yeah, this movie, I think I love the way it shows the characters in different time periods. There's that great time where they're ducking behind the tree and spying on themselves. Yeah. And Dan takes out his phone and takes a selfie with them behind him <laughs> just because he's like, I got to do this. Uh, and then, you know, there's that other selfie where she's in the water and she sees herself, her head poking out of the water Um, I just think that was really well done and I liked how you see the characters moving through time and encountering old versions of themselves or you see them catching up to a moment that we've already seen their doubles in. Uh, So that I think was really effective and well done and so many moments where someone's like running down the trail and then you see a specter of someone in the woods just in the background and how well placed they are and how that really early in the movie was creeping me out the way you would just see random figures popping up (laughs) before Mm -hmm. you really understand what's going on. Yeah. Um, like both of you, I, I, mean, I don't know if I like this as much as you two did, but I did like this a lot. I think part of my problem was that I was trying to watch it while keeping my two small children at bay who were like, hey, what are you watching over there? And I'm like, you can't, you, <laughs> you literally cannot come and look at this. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. You keep right. playing with Legos. You keep doing whatever you're doing. I think you're reading, but you're only four. So you're just kind of looking at a book. So, <laughs> um, um, yeah, so uh, I was a little bit distracted while I was watching this, but I did really like how this movie sort of, it made its own rules about like the time loop thing and then stuck to them, but it also created its own rules in a way that it didn't really matter what the rules were um, yeah. because it was smart enough to make it clear that we're never quite sure where exactly we are until at the end when it's like, Oh, Nope, definitely know where we are now. Um, I was a little worried that Jen got uh, murdered so early in the movie, but then I thought, well, this is a time loop movie. She'll come back. And then there she was. (laughs) And she was. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, when we were, when we were watching this, Shauna made a really interesting point about how they, it say, it says a lot about them that they view their other selves as like a resource. Like there's, mm-hmm. they like kill one of the Dan's just for a sweatshirt, basically. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and then they're just eating themselves and he, he basically just using them for spare parts and other things, and that's what ends up bringing those versions of themselves together. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so early twisted. on, 
early on in the film after they kill the guy the one of the dans for the sweatshirt and but he's not really dead and she keeps calling that dan it and then the dan that we're with is like stop calling me it he's he's <laughs> yeah. a person he's not an it don't call me it and so yeah there very much is an othering to you know and dehumanization going on that is yeah, really, really disturbing and kind of not surprising where the film goes. Also, along those lines, I'm really glad that you brought up Shauna's observation because it kind of reminds me of a really touching moment that's very fleeting where it's after Dan has lost Jen, but then she's back and he's like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to lose you again. I'm so sorry. I love you. We're going to get out of this and it's going to be better because that Jen doesn't know what that what's happened, but this Dan does. And it's so sweet. And then he dies and because they kill him. And then right. she's like, and she's saying to her, Dan, she's like, wow, he was so nice. What a nice version of you. And they have this debate or this discussion about better versions of themselves and then worse versions of themselves. And it's just, mm-hmm. it's so, it's so interesting. And she keeps talking about, well, it's, it, it, it ultimately comes down to choices, making good choices. And I don't, it's obviously not that simple. People, I don't think morality is that simple. I don't think people's morality come, can just be boiled down to good or bad choices. It's so binary. But it makes sense that that character thinks that. And I just, I, I find this really interesting. And there's so many, for such a simple premise and very bare bones film, ultimately, it really is so layered. And there's so much to unpack. And I just, I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it really does a lot with a little, you know, and mm-hmm. it even makes the the visual limitations that the movie has by shooting in that. Well, one smart choice, you know, you've got one location that's probably free because you're outside yep. in like a public park or something like that. And um, but they shoot from enough, you know, they're down in that ravine looking up at themselves on the path. And then there's, you know all the shots of uh, Jen in the water toward the end of the movie. And then, you know, they made that, like, that was structured in such a way that, you know, whenever they came to that, like, I don't know, it, it it's not like a fairy ring, but it's like when those stones get larger on either side and it seems like it's diverging on another path and that's always where someone ends oh, up dead. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, just a lot of little clever touches like that. And for a movie with such a low budget, surprisingly good sound design. Um, You guys know how I am about low budget sound design. And I was like, when I realized that this movie cost like three fifty to make, I was like, Oh no, the sound design is going to drive me insane, but it did not. It actually worked really well. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was nice. Mm -hmm. Well cast, uh, creepy in all the right ways. I do think that the ending was like, I didn't really need to see them eating themselves, (laughs) but (laughs) Okay. I'm glad they went there. It's just Me too. cannibalism is gross. It's it's nasty. It's weird. It's just it makes my skin crawl. But I'm glad that they went there because it it was really effective. I thought. Well, in the way that he grins you know, when guys- he sees like or he hears another Dan or another Jen off in the distance. You remember that? He's like, yes. Got, he's got like yes. her innards falling out of his mouth, and he's like, <laughs> yeah. It's just Ugh. so gnarly. Remember the, the? I think it's she fell into the pile. Of yes. Like in, of yes. Just viscera. Oh, and her blood and guts are all over. Her yeah, face. her face. Yeah. I don't know if you guys saw this in the credits, but this was such a cute little touch. One of the very last lines it. in I the credits. Yes, and no cannibals were harmed in the making of this movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a cute little touch. Loved it. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. boy. But cannibalism, you know, cannibalism in films, cannibals much like are people body- too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not what I was going to say, but sure. <laughs> but yeah, but cannibalism in films and, and body horror in general um, I, always has really fascinating things to say about bodies, consumption, agency, you name it. And so for me, in addition to just the fact that it's a it's a really downer of an ending and it's gross, which I totally dig. I also really like what it has to say about about you know, life and bodies and, you know, being stuck together <laughs> with your life partner. I don't know. I just, I, mm-hmm. I think it was great. 
Yeah. I know you I weren't know. into the ending altogether, Dave, but I loved it. <laughs> oh, no. I, it's not that I wasn't into it. It's just that like it was so gross. I was just like, Ugh. I mean, it's not Cannibal Holocaust gross, but it's... <laughs> well, no, <laughs> you know, what is? Nothing is, I don't think. <laughs> um, what I was going to say, though, uh, if as far as time loop movies go, now I haven't seen every time loop movie, but I feel like most time loop movies, in my experience anyway, you were just talking about one... Um, that is a horror film, Megan. I can't remember what you what the name of it is. The, Coco D. Coco Day. Yeah. Okay, so that's a horror movie. Most of the other time loop movies I've seen are comedies. So uh, mm-hmm. this a is lot of them usually are, yeah. happy ending. Yeah, usually exactly. Horror. Usually have at least you know a good ending to happy ending. Whereas this is like, oh boy, this is not that. <laughs> I respect that about it because so many mm-hmm. of the time loop things tie things up neatly and you know the characters resolve the loop or break the loop or whatever you however you want to say it and this is doesn't they're they're trapped and i love i love a macabre ending like that it's <laughs> like the the ending of you know tales from the crypt episodes or twilight zone episodes <laughs> or Very any of those zone-y. shows that i watched I love the macabre endings. <laughs> yeah. It kind of reminds me, not that this is a straight time loop because it's more time travel, but there, I feel like there's still somehow it kind of works. It kind of reminds me of the ending of 12 Monkeys that it's, again, it's an inevitable, oh, very yeah. dark, yes. very macabre ending, very depressing. <laughs> I'm here for it. Oh, man, I need to see that movie again. It's been a while since I watched it. Great film. Yeah, it's... Uh... Definitely a macabre ending. Have you, has either of you seen uh, La Jete, on which 12 Monkeys drew its inspiration? No, I need to. No. It's been on my list for a very long time. It's uh, it's unusual. It's, um, I mean, yeah, I won't spoil anything about it. I don't think I could spoil anything about it, frankly, because <laughs> it's uni- completely unique, even though 12 Monkeys does borrow so much from it. Um, what I was going to say about this, though aside from bumping my mic, is that um, (laughs) would you even consider this a downer of an ending or just sort of a factual ending? Like, this is just the way it plays out. You know, we've got... I mean, it's... I think... I think both can be true. I think it's factual and it's absolutely a downer ending. Unless you want to look at it from the stance of, oh, they've resolved because Jen has a tender moment and puts her head on his shoulder. So they've kind of found their way back to each other. (laughs) Yeah. Her cannibal head on his cannibal shoulder. That's right. (laughs) Cannibalism is the gift that keeps on giving that brought them back together. (laughs) Mm, Baby, your lower intestines sure do taste good. So (laughs) There's certainly some fine young cannibals by the end of the movie. Uh, I don't know how young they are, but sure. (laughs) Yeah, no, I get it. Um, Well, do we have other things to say about, um, I was going to say fine young cannibals. Thanks, Evan. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, they certainly drive each other crazy. Oh, you son of a bitch. (laughs) <laughs> you can even say that the ending is a good thing so all right <laughs> that was the second big finding on cannibals hit in case you forgot so um does I anybody <laughs> does anybody have yes. any final thoughts about this there's a bug hovering around me that's why i'm flitting around so much everybody uh audience you don't know that but evan and megan are probably like what the fuck is he doing <laughs> dave is like was, dodging his microphone yeah and he's been he's swatting like, the he's air like <laughs> weaving out <laughs> Ducking and weaving. <laughs> yeah, there's some kind of critter in here with wings. I don't know what it is, but it's it's small and it's pissing me off. So anyway, again, I ask, does anybody have anything they want to add about <laughs> <No>. Brightwood? <laughs> no, just what a what a lovely surprise. Yeah, this is a nice surprise. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, hey, thank you, uh, uh, Dan Alcar and Dana Berger and Max Wharton Dyke and everybody else. The four of you who worked on this. This is a lot of fun. It was a it was a mm-hmm. nice surprise. Um, it's more than four people. I don't want to sound flippant. Um, moving on, another horror movie about stuff. We have <laughs> we, the end. Yes, yeah, stuff. About stuff. About stuff. <laughs> we have bad things written and directed by Stuart Thorndark, like I said before, starring Gail Radkin, Hari Neff, Annabelle Dexter Jones, Rod Pereira. And um, a cameo, a glorified cameo by Molly Ringwald. Here is your one sentence IMDb summary. A group of friends go to a hotel for a weekend getaway and soon discover that women do bad things here. 
it should be bad things there, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, I guess that's right. I, I don't know. It's, I feel like that is simultaneously giving the movie too much credit and not giving it enough. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I have complicated, I wouldn't say that it's not complicated. I have, uh, divergent feelings about this, but, um, uh, Megan, let's start with you on this one. What did you think of bad things, which is an unfortunate title for a movie because there are so many different movies with the words bad things in the title, but that's okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. There are. So I was very excited to see this because while I have not seen Stuart Thorndike's first film, Lyle, I was very excited because that is a queer retelling of Rosemary's Baby and I was like yes I'm here for a woman directed queer horror film with trans actors yes let's do it and I'm like a creepy hotel and I didn't know this was actually going to be a retelling of The Shining Um, but if I had heard that I would have been even more excited and been like yes yes okay (sighs) This just made me want to watch The Shining instead because Mm -hmm. I had so many problems with this and it it pains me to say that. It makes me really sad. Um, But yeah, I had issues with the writing. I had issues with the acting, which I felt very stilted. I was frustrated that I never really learned anything about these characters other than the protagonist likes to cheat on her girlfriend and has mom issues. And that's pretty much it. And we're going to blame all of her bad, be- shitty behavior on her mom, um, who may or may not have been shitty. Sounds pretty shitty. Um, but yeah, and I just, I will never, never, never be someone who says, oh, it's not a horror film because it's not scary. I will never be that person. I will never say that because fear and scares are so subjective and what's creepy to one person is not to another Having said that, there was nothing here that I felt was unnerving or tense or anxiety inducing, nothing. And I get that this is a film that plays with reality and, you know, is there's ghosts or maybe there's ghosts or there seems to be ghosts. And that's a cool concept, but this just did not come together at all for me. And I felt like when the protagonist cracks, uh, becomes unhinged. Um, I can't think of a non-ableist way to say that, but when she loses, fully loses her grip on reality and sanity and she chainsaws her girlfriend and her, one of her best friends, it doesn't feel like that's earned. It feels like it comes completely out of left Mm -hmm. field. It feels, I mean, it's disturbing anyway, because it's, it's disturbing that, the protagonist is killing her girlfriend and close friend. But the fact that they are both trans made me wildly uncomfortable. So we're having like a queer woman kill two trans people. And it just, all of it just felt really icky to me. And yeah, this just did not work for me at all. Sadly. Evan. Sad to say I'm in the same boat. I have seen Lyle though. And I did think it was a good film. I found it unnerving and uh, really intriguing. And unfortunately, I did not find this to be either of those things. I found it to be incredibly slow. I felt like for a very... I spent most of the movie feeling like I was waiting for the movie to start or something to happen. Yes. for that not to happen. Yes, yes. Uh, There was very little that was unsettling or even disturbing. And like you said, that doesn't necessarily like mean it's a terrible movie, but it just, like you said, the acting is not great. The dialogue is not great. At least in my screener, the score was completely overwhelming the um, proceedings in a way that made it difficult to hear the the dialogue in spots. I really wanted this to be good and I just, I wasn't, wasn't a fan. I I, just wasn't working for me. Slow, not good writing, not good performances, not anything interesting happening. You were talking about the scene in the, in the parking lot where she uses the chainsaw and kills, you know, her, her girlfriend and friend. 
And that scene was just puzzling to me also because she murders them in a parking lot and there are people just walking by and like <laughs> no one is even noticing someone there with a chainsaw murdering people. Like you hear a chainsaw, like there's no mistaking the sound of a chainsaw. And so it just truly was bizarre to me that people were going about their day. And, and <laughs> unless it was all in her head. Yeah, I guess so. But I feel like the movie did not earn that. No. Agree type of reveal because it really didn't do a strong enough job of establishing what things were in her head and how much of them were in her head. It really did not do a good job of leaving breadcrumbs and giving you an idea of the things that were happening versus not happening. You need, you need someone to say you've always been the caretaker. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well that's the thing it's it's not even just a retelling or paying homage it's just straight up like scene for scene i'm surprised we didn't get an axe through a door like it's just or or the only reason we didn't get an elevator full, really. of, full of blood is because of the budget <laughs> probably um well we got milk coming down the walls in the mirror in lieu of blood yeah i don't understand I mean, I think that was I'm confusing assuming, to me. I'm assuming it's mother's. I milk. assumed it was too, but that's not what yeah. mother's milk looks like. Anyway, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but imagery wise, since this is a film about motherhood, yeah, and this is in uh, Stuart Thorndike's motherhood trilogy. Oh, good. I'm assuming there's going to be a third one. Um, yes, Lyle is the first. This is the second. So yeah, this is just all sorts of. Um, I'm just going to say bad. Um, one, you know, it's so just misguided that even though it's clearly like a shining homage slash remake slash ripoff, it doesn't feel like it is at all. No. It feels like somebody just went to a shitty hotel that was like on the verge of being torn down or whatever. And they were like, hey, can we shoot here for two weeks? And they were like, yeah, I don't give a shit. Just don't, uh, you know, don't don't cut yourself on anything and need a tetanus shot, which is what happens to one of the characters. Um, but I didn't find this scary. I didn't find it intriguing. The thing that I couldn't, that I, so we've got the blurring of reality, sort of, maybe. I, I don't think the movie actually makes it clear enough because you've got the four characters, the the main character whose name I can't remember, uh, Ruthie? Ruthie, Ruthie, yes, yeah, Ruthie. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she's dating Cal, but mm-hmm. she's cheating on Cal with the 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 woman with short hair, whose name I can't remember. <laughs> but the woman with short hair is the one who's having the visions of the ghosts. Yes. Until later, mm-hmm. Ruthie finally does because she has a whole like sit down with her mother who's not really her mother in that scene. And then these two guys, you know, one's a lawyer and one's, you know, to to sell this hotel. And it's like, make up your mind. I mean, I think one of the things that works for the shining is the shining kind of makes sense if you want it to. And it doesn't, if you don't, but I think what works so well for the shining is it is so now, Granted, enormous budget, A-list actors, A-list screenwriter, director, whatever. But it is so relentlessly what it is. It yes. is yeah. a Stanley mm-hmm. Kubrick movie turned up to 11. <laughs> yeah, the dread is palpable throughout it's the entire just, film. I mean, I've seen that. I've seen The Shining at least a dozen times, and I'm not even really sure how much I like it, but I'll watch The Shining because it's just so well done. God, it's I effective. love The Shining. Yeah. It's great. Um, I've seen that movie so many times, and I only just realized the last time I watched it, which was about six months ago, how often Jack Nicholson breaks the fourth wall in that movie. It's like yes. five times. I never noticed it before. Yes, 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 yes. There's a great Twitter thread all about that that shows every sing- literally every single frame yeah. in which had, he breaks the fourth wall. I think it came out earlier this yeah. year had no, or last year, but had yeah, no idea. Fantastic. But once I noticed it, I yep. couldn't not notice it anymore. You can't not. And it's and it's it. different from it's when he's talking to, like to Lloyd and looking at the camera. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Anyway, that's a whole different story. Yeah, but no, but the, but that's the thing. Whether that's intentional or not, like whether Jack Nicholson made that choice, whether 
Um, Stanley Kubrick made that choice. Like it's very clear. And there's so many other very clear signals like that he is losing his mind, that he has lost his grip on reality, that, Mm -hmm. you know, you very much know what's happening, even if you don't know what's happening. Like it's the, Mm -hmm. the world building is so excellent in that film. So, but this brings me totally, this brings me back to um, bad things, or as I'll call it from now on, bad movie. Um, Oh, it's so disjointed in what is real is not real that nothing really makes sense to the point where, you know, you've got these horrific things or what are seemingly horrific things going on in this hotel, but Cal and then the other friend who's the chef stay there anyway, even though Ruthie's losing her mind. It's like, what are you doing staying another night here? Right. It's mm-hmm. obviously, you know, kind of secluded because they make mention that, you know, this used to be a main road, but now it's kind of a back road or whatever because there's a highway over here. But that doesn't mean it's deserted. That just means things are a right. little farther away. You know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. you're telling me that it's so cold in upstate New York when everybody walks outside and you can't see anybody's breath. So, you know, it's not that cold. That you can't just put on your fucking boots and walk up the highway. You've made no mention that we're in some kind of weird time loop, like in our other better movie from this week. (laughs) So what is preventing you from just getting the fuck out? How many times do characters in this movie say, we need to leave, we need to leave, we need to leave, we need to leave? More than I just did, you know, so... To the film's credit, this is a small, <laughs> small credit. I will say they do try to get an Uber a couple of times and the Ubers keep canceling or rerouting. But yeah, yeah I I agree. I agree, Dave. Yeah. And so it just doesn't, just nothing holds up, you know? And Ruthie's behavior has been horrible. And Cal, despite, yes, Ruthie has cheated on Cal with, I can't remember her name, Fran, Fran, thank you. But Fran returns after they've dumped her off at a bus station. So you know that there are people nearby. Or Sorry, train station. (laughs) Right. I mean, they're next to a strip mall. Right. (laughs) When the murder happens at a strip mall that is right next to this motel. Oh, yeah. That's right. I I can only assume (laughs) that 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 murder happened in Ruthie's head. That's all I can imagine. It's the only thing that makes sense. But at the same time, obviously, she killed her mother because we find not Molly Ringwald's corpse on the third floor. And I just want to say, if you're going to go ahead and dress up a dummy or uh, an extra as Molly Ringwald, just pay Molly Ringwald the extra 10 bucks and have her do it. (laughs) Okay. I'm sure you only had her for three days or whatever, but just that, that corpse bloated and whatever just looks nothing like Molly Ringwald, who I thought was just fine in her very small role, by the way. I think that, yeah, she's probably the best thing about the movie. (laughs) Well, it's kind of amazing when you watch, um, this is maybe I shouldn't say this. Like Hari Neff is in Barbie and is very good in Barbie. I thought, yeah. Um, and in this is fine. You know, not good, not bad. I think it's more of a writing thing um, than anything else. And I have been told that Gail Rankin is quite fine in lots of other things. I've never seen Glow. You know, so oh, love her in Glow. Yeah. So I'm sure, but just kind of watching this, this is just kind of like I feel like this is sort of boilerplate. I'm losing my mind indie movie crazy you know um not not good i did not think this was a good performance right i just kind of feel like it's you know it it exists it's not bad it's not good it's just sort of there um i can't remember i think it's kind of bad yeah i can't remember what i was going to say um it was about the strip mall and how there are actually people around and you had said that the ubers keep canceling but then one uber like sends Ruthie that note at the end. It's like, um, I'm trying to find you. Where are you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> so I don't know. It's just all. The Shining doesn't make sense. Perfect sense, but it still works. And I, I think this is, you know, 
I don't know. May- well, the- go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just saying, the Shining is also so visually striking. It's so incredible. And also, mm-hmm. I care. I care what happens. I didn't give a shit what happens to any of these characters, sadly. And to me, yeah. that's the big problem. I kept smacking up against who cares? Who cares if Ruthie is cheating on Cal, as terrible as that is? Who cares? Who cares if Fran gets away? Who cares if any of them get away? I don't know. And why? I did kind of want to know more about that ghost child whose fingers were chopped off. Whose fingers yeah. weren't chopped off in the other scene. So No, they weren't. Well, right. well I think that ghost child was was supposed to be the younger version of her, right? Because yes. they, they talked about how yes. she almost lost her fingers there because her mom dropped her off there and she stayed there by herself in the middle of winter for three days. Yes. But why would there be a ghost younger self of her if she Right. Unless she's not and she's dead this whole time. I don't know. Who knows? Who the f- yeah, who the fuck knows? That's, that's <laughs> not good. Yeah, not not good world building, not good mythology. No. Uh, the, don't like you, I didn't care yeah. <laughs> about the characters. It's very, very interesting, though, to have The Shining as a point of comparison because... I mean, like the movie is fantastic, and the and the book is too. But I feel like the biggest like difference between for me the movie and the book is the the, the book Jack Torrance is a character. He's somebody who wants to be good, but he is just so he's such a like screw up that he can never do good. Like no matter how much he wants to, he, it's in his nature to be a screw up and be terrible. And I feel like that would have been really interesting to lean into in this main character uh and there's like a a small glimmer of that you have this person who's just like constantly cheating and won't you know is a terrible partner but never went anywhere interesting with that never never turned into anything fascinating it wasn't very dynamic as a character to make you interested (laughs) Mm -mm. not at all i feel i feel like it's supposed to be i'm sorry megan you were gonna say something I was uh, sorry. I was just going to say, Evan, it's interesting when you talked about the difference between the book and the movie. What I thought you were going to say is talking about Shelley Duvall's character and how her character is very different in the book than in the movie. Um, And because especially in the movie, I know Stephen King has had like a lot to say about how it's a very sexist portrayal of her and a lot of Mm -hmm. problems with Stanley Kubrick and the way that he directed uh, Shelley Long and made her very Shelley Long, Shelley Duvall and made her <laughs> like scared, you know, like literally. And, and she was constantly on edge and all of that. And so I think there definitely is obviously there's room for a feminist queer retelling of that. And but yeah, this is not that. This is not that movie. Especially when Ruthie's whole motivation for everything seems to be I told you I didn't want to come here. Oh my God. When she says that to Cal and then is like, when she talks about cheating on Cal and she's like, you made me do that. And I was like, that's abuse rhetoric 101. Like, what is this bullshit? So, okay. We get that. She's a shitty person. And, but, but there's also not enough like mom stuff. You know, if you're really going to circle back around and have it all be mom's fault, then I feel like mom needs to be, you know, uh, mommy dearest level of evil, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, we need I we mean, need more there. Abandoning your kid at a hotel for three days unattended is pretty shitty. Well, we just, we just that's mm-hmm. just a story we heard, though. And Ruthie is, if anything, an that's unreliable true. narrator. So if she told, oh, that is if very she told true. Cal that story, who knows if it's true? Just There's a well, fucking that's ghost very, child very true. there. You're who right. knows? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they did also say she hadn't heard from her mom in like seven years until the will was read after her grandmother died. And then her mom showed up in her life and just started like wreaking havoc. But again, do we know that for sure? Or is that through Ruthie, who is a non-reliable narrator? Mm. And also, if you're going to kill somebody in the dead of winter and leave the windows open, the body's not going to stink up the room that like that. Just FYI. <laughs> it's going to be too <laughs> fucking cold. Not that I've done research. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, you know why I know that? Because I remember watching Grumpy Old Men when I was a kid and being like, you know, a fish wouldn't a dead fish wouldn't stink up anybody's car in like January in Minnesota. Just it wouldn't. That's not how that's not how it works. That's not how winter works. 
So if this is upstate New York. What about when the heat's on? No, the car's <laughs> off, though. That's the whole oh, point. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. I'm that has stuck in my craw. Playing devil's advocate. That has stuck in my craw for 25 years. That's how much that bothered me. As that, somebody who grew up wow. in a cold place. So um, <laughs> that's just what I know about cold places. You know, it's like when your food goes bad and it's uh, not trash day for another five days and it's the winter, just put it outside. The animals won't even want to eat it and it won't be stinking up your house. <laughs> <laughs> I still want to know why the heat's not on in the car. Anyway, that's a that's a side <laughs> that's a side issue that does not. Oh, I can I can here. answer that. Uh, it's because he no, it's does it, no no no. I think <laughs> we don't need to get into that now. He doesn't drive the car after the fish is put in it for like three days. Oh, okay. That's why. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. We've I we've love spent. That I'm like you don't have to tell me, and you're like, no, I'm, I'm telling, telling you. Well, you. I felt like this everybody. is I'm this is a world. thread that needed to be you know pulled. Um, <laughs> we've spent more time talking about The Shining and now grumpy old men than we have bad things. I know. So, does anybody have anything else they would like to add other than um, the calls not coming from inside the house? Who the fuck knows where it's coming from? I don't know. <laughs> Because I don't have anything. Just else. sad. Yeah. I'm sad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I this is one of those movies that like it's so it just misses on so many different levels that it's just a head scratcher to me. You know, it's not it's bad, but it doesn't make me angry. I'm just like, what? Why did anyone think that this was the way to go? You know? Yeah, that's why it makes me sad. I was I was really hoping that you guys liked it more than I did. I think I think we're all on the like, same plane. I know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm glad in that regards because I'm glad that we'll see eye eye, but I'm also like, it does. It makes me sad. Yeah, it made me sad too. I mean, like, I'm just looking back on my notes, and and often when I'm a movie, I'm really not enjoying it or interested. I just stop taking notes altogether, and there's a very early stop <laughs> in my notes about this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a shame. There you go. Sounds like. Uh, Sounds like we're all talked out on uh, bad things. Not to be confused with another movie with bad things in the title. Very bad things. Which is a really bad movie in its own way. Different movie, though. So, anyway. Not to be confused with wild things. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Or where the wild things are. Okay, we could do this all night. Um, That's bad things. Let's recap. We watched Brightwood first, or we talked about it first, and we all, I think, would say, go see Brightwood. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's a yay for Brightwood. I think that's three hard nays for bad things. Oh, man. Yeah, no. Fortunately. Yeah, that is the nay of nays. Uh, you know, if I were a horse, <laughs> I'd be like, nay. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a horse joke in a while. It's true. So um, that is Spoiler Peace Theater, everybody. Those are are your two movies on Spoiler Peace this week. Um, There you go. I'm sorry we ended on on kind of a bummer, but at least Brightwood was in there too. So anyway, that's your movies. I want to give a big shout out. Thank you. And I know you both do too to our editor, Otto Clammer. Thank you, Otto, for making us sound so good each week. Thanks, Otto. Thanks, Otto. I apologize, Otto, for how many times I bumped my mic on this show. Um, you can find Spoiler Peace Theater anywhere you get podcasts. If you'd like to visit our website, it's spoilerpeace.com. If you want to follow us on social media, we're Spoiler Peace Theater on Facebook, and we're at Spoiler Peace on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. If you'd like to email us, let us know that Bad Things is actually a great movie. You can do that at spoilerpeace at gmail.com, or you can give us a call at 86221peace. And leave us a lengthy voicemail detailing all the other things we forgot about bad things that weren't good also. Um, there's no wiggle room, everybody. Just just do it that way if you do call. So, <laughs> Subsection B of t- item five. <laughs> I have one criticism in 27 parts. Part A. All right. <laughs> if you like the show, please rate and review us by going to ratethispodcast.com slash spoiler piece, or you can rate us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please do that if you have a chance. That really helps us out. If you really, really like the show, please consider joining our Patreon. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, this week we were talking about William Friedkin's 1977 jungle movie 
driving tension rah, sorcerer starring Roy Scheider and some other people you've seen or haven't seen. And <laughs> <laughs> it was a great, lively conversation. We all really enjoyed Sorcerer, mm-hmm. and it was a lot of fun. So if you uh, are a patron, please go check that out. If you're not a patron, please consider becoming one. There are a bonus, bonus episodes out the old wazoo over on patriot.com slash support the piece. My name is Dave Riedel. I write for the Chicago Reader. I am a member of the broad broadcast, the Boston Online Film Critics Association. <laughs> and you can follow me on Instagram, Letterboxd, and Threads as Dave Sees Movies. My name is Evan Crean. I'm co-chair of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and co-author of your 80s movie guide for better living. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, Blue Sky, and Threads as Real Recon, and as real as in Film Real. <laughs> I know there's so many to remember. And my name is Megan Kearns. I write film reviews for Edge Media Network. I, too, am a member of the Boston Online Film Critics Association and I'm a member of Gallica. You can follow me on Twitter and Blue Sky at Opinioness World or on Instagram and Letterboxd at The Opinioness. See every week. No, see you next week, everybody. I'm just, it's, I'm, I'm tired. I'm sorry. See you next week, everybody. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.